Hello, AP Statistics students. Mr. Eicher here, looking at the 2013 exam. Question number five on meditation. Psychologists interested in the relationship between meditation and health conducted a study with a random sample of 28 men who live in a large retirement community. If the men in the sample of the men in the sample, 11 reported that they participate in daily meditation. 17 reported that they do not participate in daily meditation. The researchers wanted to perform a hypothesis test of these hypotheses where P sub M is the proportion of men with high blood pressure among all men in the retirement community who participate in daily meditation and P sub C is the proportion of men with high blood pressure among all the men in the retirement community who do not participate in daily meditation. So it looks like from their alternative hypothesis of a less than there, they're conjecturing that the proportion with high blood pressure among the meditators will be less than the proportion with high blood pressure among the non-meditators. So basically, in other words, conjecturing that, hey, does meditation help uh, with high blood pressure? So question A, if the study were to provide significant evidence against the null in favor of the alternative, so like a low p-value, would it be reasonable for the psychologist to conclude that daily meditation causes a reduction in blood pressure for men in the retirement community? Explain why or why not. Um, so, earlier, highlighted up here that they had a random sample of 28 men. Now, if you want to know causation, if a treatment causes a response, then you need random assignment. So the answer to this question we would say is no. 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 Now if you just said that, that would not be sufficient for full credit on the AP exam. Um, so we could say we had a random sample, uh, which is good, but but we would need random assignment of treatments to infer cause and effect. Um, that would be uh, the correct idea of what you're going for. Uh, I'd like to show you another approach or something that you could add. It's it's really good to include context um, here just to make sure people know. So maybe like these treatments, you could say like treatment as in meditate or not would be our treatments that would be applied randomly to the individuals. Um, but let me show you um, a little diagram to explain like why is it important that we use random assignment. Well let's say that you find that the people who meditate, let's say you do find uh, a lower percentage with high blood pressure. High blood pressure, right? So the meditation is our explanatory variable, the lower percentage with high blood pressure, that's our uh, our statistic of our response variable. Um, but what if the people who meditate, um, maybe they also get a lot of exercise. You know, they're, they're uh, conscious about their, their health, so they're not only meditating because they think, hey, maybe meditation helps, but they're also exercising. Maybe they're also more likely to have uh, a better diet. Maybe they eat certain foods. Maybe the people who meditate are more likely to be vegetarians, and maybe vegetarian um, um, is helping to keep their blood pressure down. So what I've done here is I've tried to make an argument, hey, maybe the people who meditate are more likely to exercise, maybe they're more likely to have better diets. Um, so then the issue is we now we don't know which one is causing, which one's leading to our lower percentage with high blood pressure. Is it the meditation that's the explanation? Or is it the exercise and diet? Or maybe it's something else. 
maybe people who uh, meditate, maybe they're less likely to be smokers. Maybe they don't smoke as frequently as the non-meditators do. So there's this connection. And maybe that is the explanation or the reason why there's a lower percentage with high blood pressure. So basically what I've drawn here, tried to illustrate, is the idea of confounding. And I really like to draw this uh, triangle to explain confounding. We start with our potential explanatory variable. And then that leads to our response variable. A response variable is, hey, let's say we do get lower percentage with high blood pressure. And confounding is this idea, the confounding variable of being exercise and diet. And we have to connect it to our, ex our, our explanatory variable and explain how that could lead to our response variable. So in a good uh, experiment, we would just have this connection right here. Um, if we randomly assign the individuals to a treatment group, then the people who diet and exercise, or the people who smoke and don't smoke, they would be evenly distributed. Oh, sorry, they would be evenly distributed among the treatment groups. They wouldn't have, you know, a disproportionate amount of the exercise diet group, the, the good exercisers or dieters, all in the meditation group. Um, so that's the idea of confounding. And my little uh, confounding, confounding triangle, I like to call it. Uh, okay, so that's enough for part A. Let's look at part B. The psychologist found that of the 11 who, uh, men in the study who participate in daily meditation, zero had high blood pressure. Okay, so the P hat M, the proportion who meditate, there were 11, or sorry, there were zero out of 11 who had high blood pressure. Of the 17 men who do not participate, eight had high blood pressure. So the proportion with high blood pressure among C, that was 8 out of 17. So let P sub N represent the proportion of men with high blood pressure among those in a random sample of 11 who meditate daily. And let P sub C represent a proportion of men with high blood pressure among those in a random sample of 17 who do not meditate. Why is it not reasonable to use a normal approximation for the sampling distribution of p hat m minus p hat c. So the uh, normal approximation for that would be n times p is greater than or equal to 10, and n times 1 minus p is greater than or equal to 10. And we do that for both. We do that for the first sample size, n1, p1, n1, p1, and we'd also do that for the next sample size, uh, N2, P2 greater than or equal to 10, and N2, 1 minus P2 is greater than or equal to 10. Um, so what we have here is uh, N1, we'll say that that's our men who meditate, times 0 out of 11. That is not greater than 10, that's a 0 is not greater than 10. Right there, um, it would not be appropriate. It is not appropriate. Our condition isn't met. It's not appropriate to assume we could use a normal distribution for this sampling distribution. Um, not only is that one a problem, um, but the other one's a problem too. You'd have um, 0 out of uh, 0 is not greater than or equal to 10, the one we just had. Um, and then the 8 8 seventeenths is going to lead to 8 is also not greater than or equal to 10. So uh, I really like this question uh, because it's a different way of asking about a condition. Sometimes we get so used to checking conditions, um, but whenever a condition isn't met, uh, we don't know what to do. Um, students will often ask, hey, I'm doing this hypothesis test, this four-step process. What if a condition isn't met? And typically, conditions are met.
when you're actually doing a full significance test. Uh, but this is an example of a time where they ask you specifically about a condition. And in this case, it is not met. And the reason why it's not met is we don't have enough successes or failures to meet that condition. Um, so specifically, the uh, uh, N, the number who meditate, times the proportion who meditate is not greater than 10. So ultimately, uh, our number of successes uh, is not big enough for either group, really, the meditation group or the non-meditation group. Um, so that was part B. So in part A, um, basically is talking about a scope of inference that we needed random assignment. Part B, uh, we can't use our normal method. We can't do a normal uh, curve. So we can't really use our normal uh, test statistic and p-value that we usually do. So part C, part I like even more, uh, is how do we get a p-value if a condition isn't met? So let's look at part C. Although a normal approximation cannot be used, so remember you just answered B, and we said we can't use a normal approximation, it is possible to simulate, ah, simulation, it's possible to simulate the distribution of p hat m minus p hat c. Under the assumption that the null hypothesis is true, 10,000 values of this difference, p hat m minus p hat c, were simulated. The histogram below shows the results of the simulation. So um, these results are from simulated values, theoretical values of p hat m minus p hat c based on the results of the simulation. So they're asking us somehow we need to use these results in this histogram um, to do a significance test, basically, at least to get a p-value and conclude. What can be concluded about the relationship between blood pressure and meditation among men in the retirement community? So uh, when you're given a simulation like this, probably the most important thing to start with is to look at the axes, look at, what, look at what's being simulated, and then ask what actually happened in the study. These values are simulated values under a certain assumption what actually was this value from the study? Well, we had, I believe, if I remember, we had 11, or we had 0 out of 11 from Part B. We had 0 out of 11 um, for P hat M, minus we had 8 out of 17 for P hat C. Um, so if we calculated that, we would get the value negative 0 0.47. So this is what actually happened in the study, what we observed. That's supposed to be an error. So the question then is, how likely is a result like this due just to random chance? Well, this histogram we have is the random chance um, visual for us. So how often did this negative 0.47 occur? Well, notice right here is negative 0.7 that or more surprising, that or less, nothing really to the left of that. So that happened, negative 0.47 occurred 76 out of 10,000 trials just by random chance. Um, that would be a p-value of 76 divided by 10,000. Move the decimal place a couple times. That would be a p-value of 0 0.0076, which is very low. So we would have evidence to reject the null. And we have convincing evidence 
for the alternative p hat or the alternative we have evidence that p m minus p c is less than zero so we do have evidence that the proportion with high blood pressure is less for men who meditate at this community compared to men who do not now we don't have evidence that there's causation we talked about that in part a but we do have evidence of there's something going on here um, that men who meditate are more likely to have lower blood pressure than men who do not meditate. Now, there could be confounding variables why that might be, but we do have evidence based on this simulation. We do have evidence that the proportion who meditate have... Um, uh, there's a lower proportion with high blood pressure who meditate compared to those who do not meditate. So, um, a pretty cool problem. Um, this was a very low scoring problem, uh, as you might be able to imagine. Part C was very difficult for students. Uh, but if you're ever given a simulation, something that's simulated, um, probably the most important thing that I can encourage you about this question is figure out what it was that was simulated, and then ask yourself, well, what actually happened in the study, and then calculate that um, statistic. And then you can use that statistic to find uh, a p-value like we did here. And then it's your regular, you know, since we have a low p-value, we reject the null and we have evidence that the uh, proportion with high blood pressure is lower among people who meditate in this community compared to people who do not. Thanks for watching this video. Good luck on the exam.